Hi, I'm Stacy Byer, CEO of the Pinellas Education Foundation, and thank you so much for being here this evening. The Pinellas Education Foundation is honored to co-host this forum. As a partner with Pinellas County Schools, we recognize the significant contributions our school board members make. We share a commitment to student achievement and to providing the environments and supports that give our students and their teachers the best chance for success. Whether students will attend college or obtain technical training or choose to go directly to a job, the foundation collaborates with district leaders to nurture student success in the classroom from pre-K through adult education to better prepare students for the world that awaits them upon graduation. We appreciate the role our school board members play in participating in what can be tough decisions and their willingness to take on some of education's most pressing challenges. We are grateful for their dedication and the many hours they invest to ensure that Pinellas County students receive the best education possible. Thank you tonight to all of our candidates, to our co-hosts, and to all of you here this evening. We appreciate your attendance, and now I'm going to turn it over to the president of the Pinellas PTA, Christina Garcia. Thank you all for being here tonight, especially the school board member candidates. My name is Christina Garcia, and I am the president for Pinellas County Council PTA. I want to thank our partners, Pinellas Education Foundation, the League of Women Voters, SPC Institute for Strategic Solutions for helping us put together what is sure to be an informative and important evening. I would also like to say a special thank you to our moderator, Al Rochelle, for working with us year after year to provide such an important service to our community. PTA is the largest volunteer organization in the nation. Our mission is to make every child's potential a reality. We hope that you will consider joining one of your local PTA units here in Pinellas County to help us work toward that mission. Again, thank you for being here for such an important evening, and we hope that it is very informative. Welcome. I'm Marty Falwell. I'm president of the League of Women Voters of North Pinellas County. I commend you for caring enough to be here tonight. The League of Women Voters has its roots in the suffragette movement to get the vote for women in the early 20th century. The purpose of the League the League of Women Voters, a nonpartisan political organization, encourages infor informed and active participation in government. It works to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Currently, one of our main concerns is that we not only continue to have free and fair elections, but that our people have faith that our elections continue to be free and fair. Thank you. Well, good evening. It's such a pleasure to see all of you all tonight. Thank you so much for our in-person audience and for our virtual audience who is equally important. My name is Kimberly Jackson and I am the Executive Director for the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. We sit on the Seminole campus, but we are one college. We have the privilege of being left this wonderful organization by Congressman Bill Young, who sought to have a space for nonpartisan conversation, for social, political, and economic discourse, and to understand the appropriate scope of government. So we're honored and grateful that he left this to us to have the candidates have a space to have conversations about what matters. We're grateful to the provost of this campus, Dr. Tashika Griffith, for allowing us for, to have our forum here. As you know, we have many campuses and many spaces, and we're grateful for her to let us have this program here tonight. We're also thankful to the Clearwater um, Police Department for sharing and lending their hand to keep us safe. 
a special thanks to Al Rochelle, who since his retirement has come out many, many times to help the Institute and is a strong friend. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank our many partners um, with the Pinellas Education Foundation, William Daly, Reagan Miller, of the Pinellas uh, County Council, the PTA, and Vivian and Marty from the League of Women Voters, and for the candidates, again, for stepping up. I would like to introduce Al, but of course he does not need a huge introduction, so I'll make it quick. Al Rochelle, of course, is the moderator of the county. He was popular and trusted as the midday anchor at Channel 9 since his launch in 1997, where I had the pleasure to serve him with them then, and the host of Political Connections. Prior to that, he was with WTSP TV for six years, and he made his transition. He generally donates his time, his expertise, his talent, and his charm. Thanks, Al. Let's have a good forum. Thank you. Now, Kimberly was one of our producers and writers, and boy, was she good, let me tell you. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Al Rochelle, and welcome to the 2022 Pinellas County School Board Candidates Forum. Tonight, we're at the Clearwater campus of St. Petersburg College. This forum is brought to you by the Pinellas Education Foundation, Pinellas County Council PTA, the League of Women Voters, and the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions at St. Pete College. This evening, you'll meet candidates running for at-large and single-member districts of the Pinellas County School Board. The winners of these races will have a tremendous impact on the education of our children, one of the defining hallmarks of our American way of life. Their decisions will likely affect our nation literally for years to come, a sobering thought for all of us to consider as we cast our vote, first in the primary election on August the 23rd and then the general election on November the 8th. Now, as you know, these are nonpartisan races. If no candidate wins the majority of the vote in the primary, that being defined by winning 50% plus one vote, the two candidates receiving the most votes in each contest will be in the runoff on the November 8th general election ballot. You may vote early at any of the three supervisor of elections offices from August the 13th through the 21st, and vote by mail ballots are available upon request. That's a change in the law. You want a mail-in ballot, you need to request it. Visit the Supervisor of Elections website at votepinellas.com for more information about voting. All right, now the rules. We have a lot of candidates who are important. We keep things moving. That's my job. I'm the conductor. I got the whip here, and we're going we're gonna to roll tonight, candidates. Your job in the audience behind me is to watch respectfully. No hollering, no hooting, no clapping, and no tomato throwing. All right, I think I pretty much covered it all. Please silence your phones and no video recording tonight. You'll be able to see full programs this on the websites that we're gonna mention later today, but no video recording and please silence your phones. Now the candidates. Boy, don't they look good? Nine of them tonight. Let's give them a round of applause just to make them feel welcome. All right, we have at-large districts two and three. That means everyone votes for them. And single-member districts six and seven, where only those living in those districts get to vote. We will ask candidates the same number of questions. Candidates will be given an equal amount of time to respond, about a minute. At the end, if you go too long, I'll come up on the stage and put my hands over your mouth. No, I won't do that. <laughs> we'll wrap it up within five seconds of the bell and the sound that you have from our excellent timers. They're gonna be watching very carefully. And if you go over, I will politely interrupt you. Now, the order of who will answer the question first will be rotated so that no one person has to be the first or the last to answer the question. I'm not sure whether that's good or bad. You'll figure it out tonight. <laughs> I'll also make it clear who answers first, and then we go right down the line in the order the candidates are sitting at the tables. Sounds complicated, but I guarantee once we get rolling, it's pretty intuitive. Questions for the candidates have been solicited from the general public through the Pinellas County Council of PTA's website and ISPS's forum registration page. We had to narrow them down to just a short of a dozen that we're gonna to try to get to tonight. We had more than 30 to choose from. And at the end of the question and answer period, each candidate will be given one minute for a closing statement. All right, candidates, take a breath. Here we go. Let me introduce the candidates. Lisa Kane, at large district number two. Brad DeCordy, at-large district number two. Keisha Benson, at-large district three. Carl Z. Zimmerman, at-large district three. 
Brian M. Martin, single member district number six, Stephanie Meyer, single member district number six, and Kimberly Works, single member district number six. And in district number seven, Caprice Edmond and Maria Di Fiore Solanke. And I'm gonna mention that Ms. Solanke has to leave early this evening, so when you speak her off the stage, I didn't scare her off, okay? She has a previous enjoyment. So thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we'll also be ringing a bell for her because she has a hard time looking this direction, so she'll get the sound cue. Everybody else, you gotta listen and watch and listen for my cue. So here we go. What are your qualifications for the position of Pinellas County School Board member? What makes you the best candidate? Candidate Kane, you have one minute. Thank you so much, and thank you so much to the audience for taking your time to be here this evening, and also the Pinellas Ed Foundation, the League of Women Voters, the PTA, and also ISPS for hosting this event this evening. My name is Lisa Kane. I am a mom of four. I have been a teacher in our community for over 15 years. I am a small business owner, and I'm a native to Pinellas. I've grown up in Pinellas County, and I've attended these schools. I believe we live in the best county in the state of Florida, and I see no right reason why we can't have the best school district in the state of Florida. I am a firm believer in arts education. I am a musical theater teacher, and I believe that the arts increase student brain function and also increase student performance in every subject matter. I'm also a strong and firm supporter of career technical uh, certification programs throughout our county. I look forward to speaking with you more throughout the evening. Thank you. All right, thank you. And just for the audience to know that we are holding up a 30-second sign. The 15-second sign says, Go Gators. Oh, I didn't say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, and the 15-second sign will be there, and then we'll have the wrap-up sign, which is a big stop sign, which uh, you'll, you'll want to stop. So those are the signs. All right, let's go on. Candidate DeCorty. Okay, um, I am a product of public, school, public education myself. My two sons are both... Uh, products of Pinellas County Schools, graduating from Tarpon Springs Middle or High School. I have been uh, teaching at Tarpon Springs Middle School for the past 22 years uh, in the classroom. I have seen every, I've seen all the things that need to go on, or go on in the classroom. I've worked as an advocate uh, through the Teachers uh, Association up in Tallahassee, uh, arguing for, or trying to argue for um, what students need, what teachers need, and what parents need from the legislature, which is not always an easy task. Um, that is what I think is, you know, what makes me qualified the 22 years in the classroom with, er with all the different workers, bus drivers, social, uh, the uh, support staff, and administration. Thank you. All right, candidate Benson, you now have one minute. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Keisha Benson. I was born and raised in Pinellas County. My mother was an educator here for 37 years. I went through K through 12. I was bused out to Stark Elementary, went to Southside Fundamental and Lakewood High School. So I experienced with all the different programmatic pieces in Pinellas County. I'm the mother of three children, a six, eight, and nine year old. They just had birthdays. So it tells you that I'm vested in this work. I will be in the Duke School District for the next eight to 10 years with this. I'm a college professor for over a decade now, and I also am a social worker. So I've worked with children and family for the past 25 years doing this work. I've been a leader in this community since I've been home. And in that, I've run programs at the city level and also at the county level. So I've done equitable economic development. I've also done Thrive by Five Pinellas, which was birth to five outcomes, getting kids ready for kindergarten. And the other piece of this, I believe in this work. And I always tell people that I stand for all children. And when I say that, I mean regardless of race, religion, socioeconomic status, gender identity, ability, I stand for all children. And I'm happy to do, be here today. Thank you. All right, thank you. Candidate Zimmerman. My name is Carl Zimmerman. The Z is because that's what my students always refer to me as. Uh, I served in the Florida legislature on three education committees. Uh, I went there because I wanted to try to fix some of the things that I saw in public schools. I've been a teacher for 33 years in Pinellas County, and that's important because I've lived and breathed education. I know what works and I know what doesn't work. And it bothers me that we continue to do the same wrong things over and over again. I'm a major proponent of what I call application education, which in simple terms, most people would refer to it as vocational education. But it's a type of teaching that I think should be applied to all courses, all subjects, and be available to all students, even the ones that are that smart that they're going to go to Harvard or Yale. I think they have the right to enjoy their education as well. Thank you. All right, candidate Martin. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Brian Martin and I'm running for the District 6 seat on the Pinellas County School Board. 
Uh, I'm a native Floridian. I'm from Bradenton, just across the bridge. Uh, I'm a product of the Florida public school system. I graduated from AP High School. I have a degree in chemical engineering from the University of South Florida. And I spent the last 15 years working on water treatment and process separation equipment in power plants, refineries, and other industrial facilities. Um, I've got, you know, I'm married to my lovely wife, Megan, who's a local pediatric emergency medicine physician, and we have four children currently enrolled in Pinellas County Public Schools. Um, as the only candidate in District 6 with kids in public schools, I'm highly invested in public education. Um, I've, I've been endorsed by the Pinellas Classroom Teachers Association, Pinellas Education Support Professionals, the Florida Education Association, the National Organization of Women, uh, the Service Employees uh, Industrial Union, and I, I'm just, I'm highly vested in public education and I want to do everything in my power to make it better. I'm not beholden to any political party or politicians. Right. Thank you. Candidate Meyer. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Meyer, and I'm running for Pinellas County School Board in District 6. I grew up here. I'm a native, a native to Pinellas County. I went to our public school system. Um, I am now a public and private school teacher in our county and also in Hillsborough County. After spending 17 years in the marketing and sales world, um, I became an educator about five years ago. Um, I also have a master's degree in history, which I think is very important. Um, we And I'm the only one in the race who has any classroom experience as far as my race and um, is currently in the classroom now. So I'm running because I'm a strong supporter of parental rights. I'm a strong supporter of our teachers. Um, our schools are in serious need of reform and I've seen how much they've changed over the last 22 years since I was a student myself here. I'm dedicated to reforming our public schools and I look forward to answering all of your questions tonight. Thank you. All right, candidate works. Good evening. Thank you to all of those that put on this wonderful event tonight, and I'm very honored to be a part of it. My name is Kimberly Works. I'm running for um, District 6, single member. Um, I am a parent of three graduates of Pinellas County Schools. I'm also the grandmother of four students that are currently involved in Pinellas County Schools, so I am very invested on what happens within the district. Um, I have been involved in three schools, uh, Pinel uh, Parent Teacher Associations, or PTAs. I was also involved in the Pinellas County Council at PTA under two presidents. I've been involved in the School Advisory Council, which handles the fiduciary funds that come down from the county to each individual school. I do have classroom experience however it was in career and trade I was a cosmetologist for 30 years so I do have instructional experience but however it was not in instructional inside the classroom um, I am married to a Navy veteran and uh, he also has EMS experience um, I am an advocate for our children, especially in the ESC department. I was in the Exceptional Student Education Committee with Pinellas County Schools for four years as an advocate for um, autism parents. I'm really looking Hi. forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Candidate Edmond. Good evening. My name is Caprice Edmond, and I'm running for re-election to Pinellas County School Board District 7. I was born and raised in St. Petersburg, and I attended public schools. Graduating from Gibbs High School, I attended the University of South Florida, where I earned a bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's in elementary education, a master's in educational leadership, and a certification in infant family mental health. My life's work and career has been all about children. I've served as a guardian at Lightham for over 10 years, working with youth in foster care as a youth development specialist, independent, independent living specialist, as well as teaching for Pinellas County Schools prior to being elected during the 2020 election cycle. Since the election in 2020, I have advocated for safety, fiscal responsibility, academic success, recruitment and retention, and so much more. I look forward to answering your questions this evening. Thank you. And candidate Solanke, go ahead. Hi, my name is Maria Solanke. The Pinellas County School budget is about $1.6 billion, and I have extensive experience working on budgets, and we need someone like this on school board so we can cut wasteful spending and direct it to people who can use it and need a raise. I also have extensive experience working in mental health and working with children from traumas, we need to put a huge focus on mental health. There are so many people worried about school violence, and unless, unless we address the mental health issues, we will continue to have school violence. 30. 30? Oh, sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> that messed me up a little bit. Um, mental health. We'll, we'll give you 10 more seconds. Okay, Go ahead. sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, so it's two for 30 and one for 15? 
Yes. Two okay. beeps? Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So my, uh, my focus on mental health and school violence is something on everyone's concern right now. We need to look at children holistically, and I think I bring innovative ideas and not the same ideas that have not been working. So I look forward to speaking more this evening, and I appreciate everyone having me here today. I'm sorry for messing up on that. <laughs> oh, no, you're, no you're, you're fine. You're absolutely fine. Better than having me have one of those ooga horns. Ooga, ooga. <laughs> that wouldn't work very well. All right, you feel good? You got the first one out of the way. Nerves are done. Now we move on. As a school board member, you're responsible for the safety of our children. How would you ensure or even improve safety measures at our schools, and how will you pay for those measures? Candidate DeCorti, you're first. Okay, uh, this is one of the issues I think is most important is the health and safety of our, stu our students, our teachers, our bus drivers, our cafeteria workers, everybody. Um, we have been argue, advocating for this up in Tallahassee for years, that, that the students need more professional help in the schools. They need some uh, social, social workers, they need psychologists in the schools. Um, when we came back from the pandemic, we just put them in a classroom and said they were okay. They weren't okay, they were still struggling after two years or after another year and a half. So they, um, so they need that professional help. Now what we have to do is we have to start looking at where we can cut. This year, we had books that, I just, that just got thrown out at the end of the year because they were not used. That's funding that could have been used for something else. Um, I know some of these things are, are regulated by the state, so we're gonna have to deal with the state, but we have to look at tightening the, tightening the funding and seeing where we can make cuts and not hurt the students. Thank you. All right, and I, I want to rephrase the question just so everybody understands. You're responsible for the safety of our children. So how would you ensure or even improve safety measures at our schools? Uh, candidate Benson, go ahead. Not that your answer was fine. You're fine either way. Go ahead. Thank you. So when I think about safety, I think about it from a number of standpoints. First, when I consider disease mitigation, when we had the COVID-19 standards out, we thought about the fact that the school board had dashboards, but those boards were often lagging behind. And the work that I was doing at the Foundation for the St. Petersburg, we kind of tracked those things. So I want to make sure that we have consistent and communication out there to parents to let them know and staff what's going on around disease mitigation and what play takes place there. I also think about it from an active shooting standpoint. The district has a plan for active shooters. I think we can have more training for our SRO officers. We can get deeper into what that looks like, make sure the kids are aware of their mental health services, and that we have enough mental health providers across the school. I also think about environmental justice. I saw the school board member Edmund was able to bring out some issues around Child's Park when they had environmental justice issues. There should be no school that has those opportunities where the kids can't even go on the playground and play because of environmental issues. So advocating for those and letting them know what their rights are. I think the last piece of that for me, when you think about the budget, the school district has $1.6 billion budget. We can think about coming together with resources, looking at municipalities, looking at business leaders, and thinking about how can we pull those resources further to make it stretch. Thank you. All right, Mr. Zimmerman, go ahead. The dominant issue here is, is uh, active shooter. To me, that's the thing that comes to mind first. When I was a legislator, I wrote legislation to secure our schools, to make our classroom safer. Uh, at the school that I was at at the time, Countryside High School, you couldn't lock the door from the inside. Every teacher had to exit the room, lock the door from the outside, while the, the active shooter would just be sh picking them right off. Uh, much of that has been changed. It was, I was under the impression that was all changed. However, I found from some teachers there are still schools in this county that you still have to go lock the door from the outside. That's number one. Number two, I really like what our chief has done. Uh, he's done, taken some measures. I like that the, act, that the police are able to take over the security cameras and monitor things that are going on. And the final thing to that is the shooter is always, almost always, one of our own. So we need to, we need to stop them before they become an active shooter. Thank you. All right, candidate Martin. So school safety is a top priority. It should be for everyone here on the board. Um, Pinellas County Schools has a number of plans in place. Um, they work with the Sandy Hook Promise. Uh, they have a program called Start With Hello that teaches students to be more inclusive to try and reduce social isolation. It's a strategy to get kids from, you know, becoming violent before it happens. Um, teachers and staff are trained to be trusted adults, someone that the students can go to to talk with about concerns and threats. Uh, every school in the county has a site-based team that handles threats and works with the local police. Every school has a armed safety resource officer. Um, every school does active assailant trainings. Um, but the biggest hole in the Pinellas County safety is the access to mental health services. 
Um, the current ratio for students and counselors is 1 to 434. Mm -hmm. uh, for social workers, 1 to 780, and the, for psychologists, 1 to 1,089. That's where we really need to get and try and stop violence before it happens. All right, candidate Meyer. Thank you. Well, here in Pinellas County, we have the um, one of the most important tools, and, and that is our sheriff, uh, who what worked on the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Douglas report, which is if we're following that report and we're following the um, outline of that report and the information that was given to us in that report on how to make our schools more safe and secure, then we, we'll be doing the right thing. One of the things that we have not done in all of our schools is make sure that all of the exteriors are hardened. I think that's the first thing that we need to do. Um, the second thing that we need to do is look at restorative practices. Um, we can look at past incidences of violence and see that uh, restorative practices have not worked in many instances, and this is why I have been calling for reform when it comes to our discipline and our reporting of violent activity and threats um, that students may make in our schools. So I would hope to have the opportunity to talk a little bit more about that tonight. Um, but I've also been endorsed by the Pinellas, or I'm sorry, by the Police Benevolence Association, um, which obviously is important. All right, candidate works. Um, I have recently been able to speak to the director of the guardianship program, uh, the guardian program that we have here in Pinellas County Schools, and I honestly, we have 110 uh, guardians within the district. Uh, they are all at the charter schools and the elementary schools. I think we need more, to be honest with you. Um, I would like to implement more of the guardians on our campuses, including the middle schools and the high schools. Um, and I think that we, I have just recently actually read the new uh, strategic plan that's going out for the 22-23 school year. Um, so by following that strategic plan and implementing more safety guidelines, and we actually, we actually have a behavioral issue here in Pinellas County Schools. And I don't mean, you know, our kids are bad, but we have had a, um, an issue with them with trying to acclimate back into society and acc acclimate back into a social life. So um, I think that uh, if we focus on all of those things and we try to get um, our schools um, more safely uh, get those guardians in place, I think that will help uh, our students much, much better in the future. All right, candidate Edmund. This is a great question and definitely top of mind for everyone due to the most recent events. I think it's important to point out the facts that legislators have implemented laws that we must follow mm -hmm. as a governing body and that we are following. I think it's also important to talk about our relationships with the local, municip the local agencies, local law enforcement, and how we are working collaboratively through our interagency agreement to ensure that safety is top priority. Something that we've done recently as a school board is purchase or support it, increase communications. Most recently, we approved a grant that will allow for additional threat assessment teams. Each school has a threat assessment team. Obviously, we can always do more as it relates to protecting our teachers and students, but I think it's important to highlight what we are currently doing. Thank you. Ms. Solanke. Look, SSOs and SROs are great line of defense, but we need to focus on preventing and not reacting. So that means focusing on mental health. How do we do that? One, why don't we start the day every day with prayer, meditation, or yoga? Two, why don't we get kids outside more? This could be as simple as taking reading class outside. It, there is so much research out there. When kids are in nature, they feel better. They release endorphins. We also should have community involvement before and after school programs, and let's pick that up. Let's bring more involvement. Next, we also need to have better nutrition. When we eat properly, we feel better. But if we continue to give children food that makes them sick, they tend to be over-medicated. And we know that over-medication and medications can lead to other mental health issues. This will also help strengthen their immune system and protect them from viruses as well. So we need to look at the child holistically to address their mental health issues. All right, thank you. Ms. Candidate Kane. Thank you so much. This is a, a fantastic question. As a mom of four, school safety is the, one of the top priorities, I believe, for everyone up here and any parent in Pinellas County, when you bring your child to school and you drop them off, you don't want to feel anxious, worrying that something could happen to them in the school day at their school. You want to feel that it's a safe environment. 
I feel that Pinellas County Schools is tackling this in a multitude of ways because with the towards the end of the pandemic, we're not only tackling school safety through health and wellness, but also through active shooter drills by protecting our students from within and also without, from all sorts of dangers. And we need to look at this multifaceted issue in a variety of ways. I think that one of the major uh, inconsistencies is consistency in upholding the policies that are set in place for safety and increasing the school hardening consistently in every school, because not every school is uh, given the same budget for that. All right, question number three. Now this is a two-parter, so this is gonna be even tougher. You <laughs> thought one minute was hard to do. Answer two questions in one. Here we go, the two-parter. What is the biggest concern you think that parents have with the school system? Second part, what is your greatest concern? We start out with candidate Benson. Well, this is interesting because I'm both the parent and the concern for me. So when I think about this, I went to Pinellas County Schools and I had a diverse, robust education. I had friends from so different socioeconomics, race, religion, across the board. And I came back 20 years later from my kids in the district and the schools feel more segregated than they were 20 years ago. So for me, when I think about public education, I want my children to have a robust, diverse education. So looking at some of the equity issues across our district, if we look at kindergarten readiness, third grade reading levels, high school graduation rates, looking at the gap between some of our students, we have a bridge in the gap plan, but we know that we're still falling deeply behind with some of our students. So when we consider the word equity, unfortunately it's been politicized, but equity just means that depending upon where their needs are, making sure that those needs are met. And when I consider what that means for me, and again, this is both me as a parent and a candidate, I want to make sure that every child has what they need to have a quality, safe public education and to make sure that those welcoming all children in this sense. So really looking at what some of those gaps are across the district, how can we get into that better, thinking about how we resource schools and educators better. Thank you. All right, candidate Zimmerman, same question. I think parents are concerned about, number one, what, what the kids are learning, what they're being taught. They want to know what is happening in the classroom. Uh, and they want to know, is there a pathway to success for their child? Uh, my concerns are to make sure there are pathways for success. That's when I talk about application education. It, it's a matter of the way we present it. You know, we have a, a major problem right now with kids not wanting to go to school, and it's not the way it was, you know, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, kids now have experienced two and a half years of, I don't have to go to school. And they can figure out ways, they can do it online, they can you know, take their GED. School is not as important to them. So my concern is I wanna make school more important to them. I want them to wanna go to school just the way I wanted to go to school to take auto shop, wood shop, metal shop, things like that. Things that I actively used my hands to do. Thank you. Candidate Martin, same question. Two-parter, parents' concerns, your concern. So I'm, a, I'm both a parent and running for school board. Um, my, my biggest qualifications, I've got four kids in the school system. Um, so my biggest concern, I've got, I got two, um, school safety. You know, after things like Uvalde happen, you know, I just want to make sure when I drop my kids off at school, I'm going to pick them back up at the end of the day. Um, but we did just talk about that. So one of my other concerns is te teacher and staff retention. Um, my fourth grade son lost both of his teachers this year um, to other professions. Um, they both left with months left in the school year. Uh, one was replaced by a permanent three-month-long sub, and then the other, they it, it had multiple subs, and then they were finally replaced with a full-time teacher. Um, my daughter rides the bus 25 minutes to Thurgood Marshall Middle School. Um, the bus situation this year was was quite terrible. Um, she was consistently 30 to 60 minutes late. She missed about a, a period every day um, for months. Um, so making sure that we can get our students to class, making sure we have teachers to teach them. All right, candidate Meyer, same question. I believe the biggest concern that parents have is what are their children learning at school? Are their children going to school and are they going to leave school when they are done with 12th grade, prepared for adulthood, prepared for the workforce, prepared for whatever trade they decide to go into, or prepared for college? And I agree with parents, 100%. Um, I believe that we need to restore the value of education. It's been lost. Um, and I think a lot of the reason why is because of the politicization of our education system that has become more and more prevalent and more and more pervasive over the last two decades, definitely since I left Pinellas County Schools as a student. 
Um, I also think we need to restore respect in the classroom. Our teachers need to be respected by their students. But in order to do that, our parents need to feel also respected and our parents need to feel that they can entrust that what their children are learning at school is really of value. So we need to restore that parent-teacher relationship. All right, candidate works. Um, I think parental concern, um, and I think this is more across the board, would be communication. Uh, I think a lot of parents are saying, this happened to my son today, they didn't even call me. Um, and I think that we used to have the text, we used to get calls, this is when my kids were in school, and now that my grandchildren are in school, uh, my daughter or my son-in-law will call me and say, you know, this happened and they didn't even call me. So I think the communication um, goes a long way. I think with the, the school board or any of the administration that uh, speaking to parents is a big deal. Um, now, as far as my direct concerns, I would have to agree with Mr. Martin is um, staff retention. Um, I think that we need to do more about going to uh, job fairs, especially the one in Greenwood that's held on Saturdays. I think um, going and having uh, more support for our educational staff um, going and I know we changed um, our bus routes and those kind of things but I think helping to get out there and um, add to our staffing our bus transportation and our substitute teachers our teachers and helping uh, grow our educational staff would be uh, best. Candidate Edmund. So what, what I hear from many parents is what are their students learning as well as how are they being taught? Are, are they being provided a well-rounded education inclusive inclusive of the diversity that represents this county? Are they learning um, reading strategies that are best practice? Are they receiving the individualized support that their child needs, whether it's through a 504 education plan or IEP? Something else that I hear is a great concern is recruitment and retention not having enough bus drivers, not having enough nurses in our schools, and not having enough certified teachers. Mm -hmm. It's extremely important that we have highly qualified professionals in front of our students. That is how we address many of the challenges that we face ahead of us. When we look at social emotional learning and meeting the needs of the whole child, we only accomplish that by having certified and highly qualified people in front of our children. Thank you. Candidate Solanke. So different parents have different concerns. It's just not one concern across the board. The bus situation has come up over and over again where families are arriving, or students are arriving an hour late. Even teachers are concerned with this because they lose an hour worth of teaching. The mental health crisis related and school violence is a big concern for families. And of course, there are parents who work in the school and don't know how they will keep up with inflation and pay their rent, whether they are a bus driver or a teacher. One of my biggest concerns are the low performing schools. In my district, there are nine low performing schools that make the Florida Department of Education lowest performing schools list. 75% of third graders cannot read at a third grade proficiency. It doesn't get easier in fourth grade, and I'm not sure how high school uh, teachers can deal with it at, if they continue to go through the ranks and not get a good grasp on reading, then they, they really lose it and don't have a chance in the future. Thank you. All right, thank you. Candidate Kane. Thank you so much. As a parent, and I, what I also hear from other parents is I think there is one concern that we all share regardless of uh, our point of view, and that is we're concerned for the overall well-being of the child and of the student. The big question for me is, is, is my child learning? Is my child passionate, inspired, and invested in what they're learning in the classroom and in their education? When we see that, we see them developing a pathway to success. We need children to be inspired by what they're learning so that we can, and we can support the overall well-being of that child mentally, emotionally, um, physically, and in every way. We need to look at everything that they are offering. We need to look at their skills. We need to um, offer them opportunities that speak to their skills as well and, and open up a world of learning for them so they can be excited about their education. I really think that that's what most parents are looking for, for their child to be inspired and their child to be on a path to success, regardless of where that leads. Candidate DeCorte. Um, as, a, as a teacher, in a as a classroom teacher, I, I go to a lot of parent conferences and I think what, the, what parents are interested in is what their child is getting. Um, that their child is getting what they need 
they, that they are getting the materials, they are getting the help if that's what they need. Um, so each one is, is different. They, they, you know, parents are concerned with their own child mostly, their own children. Um, as a teacher though, I have to be concerned with making sure everybody gets what they need. So that is where we need some extra help. We need to make sure that the teachers are there all the time, the same teachers, uh, re re retaining teachers that can keep, keep a steady flow of learning with those kids. Um, but, it, but it's, you know, we, it's that equity that, that we, t we talk about, that everybody's getting what they need. Um, it's not equality, it's equity. And that's, what th that's where I think the concerns are, is that each kid gets what they, what they need, what they deserve. Thank you. All right, this next one's a, a little bit of a two-parter, although it can be answered in one. It's kind of got a why and then what would you do, because you've already brought up the subject about uh, teachers, staff, and students leaving the public school system in higher numbers than we have ever seen in the past. Whether that's COVID-related, I mean, who knows. Uh, but second part of the question, how do you plan to change the trend? Why are they leaving, and how would you change? Mr. Zimmerman. One of the main reasons they're leaving is uh, <clears throat> legislature has taken away a lot of the things that kept teachers teaching. Teachers, uh, a lot of people mistake why teachers teach. They don't teach for the money. I mean, yes, teachers are underpaid, but that's not why teachers teach, and that's not why teachers leave. Teachers teach because it's a mission, just like police officers police because it's a mission. We need to try to, as a board, we need to do everything we can to overcome those obstacles that have been thrown in front of us by the legislature. And those obstacles are, the different bills that we have to enforce and we have to worry about while we're teaching. Uh, the lack of security. We have, teachers have no job security. They can be fired at will, which is something they didn't have to deal with before. So as a school board, we need to reduce that stress and we need to take away as much paperwork as we can and we have to get back to letting teachers do what they want to do, which is teach students. Kennedy Martin, same question. Teachers and staff are, you know, Florida has a critical shortage in teachers and support professionals. Uh, a lot of this has to do with Florida's in the bottom seven nationally in teacher pay. Um, we just passed an $800 million increase to teacher pay, but the majority of that went to um, new educating professionals, which on the one hand is great, but that's a real way to, you know, not respect and undervalue your current veteran teachers. Uh, we've got veteran teachers that have been teaching for five, seven, 12 years, and now they're making the same amount of money as our new teachers. Um, that, that's a really rough way to ask them to continue the profession. Um, we need to look at ways to try and carve some more money out of the budget to increase pay for teachers. Um, they're highly valued and respected members of the community. We need to have um, open and honest conversations with them. We need to improve the, um, the way we treat them. Um, and as for uh, students and families leaving the district, you know, the pandemic brought a lot of political divisiveness into the school board and public schools. Um, trying to tamp some of that back down. Uh, that's it. All right, candidate Meyer, same question. Why are they leaving? How do you plan to change it? Teachers are leaving because of, I believe, of the disciplinary problems in the classroom and the lack of will by many to address those issues. Instead, we've continued to put Band-Aids on those issues instead of addressing them head on. If I'm elected to the board, I will work collaboratively with the other members to come up with solutions. We have got to get to the point where we are no longer putting Band-Aids on this problem that has plagued our district and has only gotten worse um, decade after decade. And so we need to work together in order to come up with solutions. Um, first, I think that we need to ensure that we are enforcing sound consequences, fair consequences across the board for egregious behavior. There's nothing worse than trying to teach a class. And I know as a teacher, a current teacher here in this county, um, that when you're trying to teach your kids, it's, you know, and there's two or three kids that continually act up and they have no consequences and they continue to get away with it, it affects the education of everybody else in the room. So we have to address this and we need to address it now. All right, candidate work, same question. Why are they leaving and how do you plan to change it? Um, like I said before, I think with the, uh, the communication issue, it's just going back to trying to do the, the calls and the texts that we used to have before. And as far as the teacher retention, um, I do know that there's been a lot of stress. They've been out of school for a couple years. And I have been working and communicating with educators from across the county. I have built relationships in the last 15 years with being a parent and being a very involved parent. And they have been talking to me. 
they have been telling me what's going on. And it's not just behavioral issues. It's not, there's been many, many different issues that have been keeping them from staying. But a lot of them are very passionate about this district and they love what they do and they're not going anywhere. And there's different pay structures. There's pay by, um, there's pay by year and there's pay by performance. So there's different ways that these educators are paid. But I think, again, like I said, if we go to the, the uh, job fairs and we have these educators speak out about why they're passionate about this district and what they love about it, that it will help us um, get those educators back into this district that we need. Thank you. Candidate Edmund. As a former PCS educator and hearing from people who are retiring or uh, resigning, I am also aware just from speaking with our HR department that people are leaving due to the pay, getting better opportunities, moving, as well as the culture and climate within the district. I am excited to have Superintendent Hendricks and hearing his ideas of improving the culture and climate because we know and we've heard from several people up here that if the classroom culture improves, we're able to uh, reduce behavior challenges and get back to educating each and every child. That's how we'll make up for some of the time lost as well as address the achievement gap and allow teachers to be, uh, to just teach and have that love for learning that they got into the profession for. Thank you. Ms. Solanke. Sorry, before you start, can you clarify you asked for teachers and other staff, correct? I'll say it again. Why are teachers, staff, and students leaving the public school system in higher numbers, and how do you plan to change the trend? Okay, well, one issue is that, you know, everyone talked about teachers up here. We're forgetting about all these other staff members that are equally involved in building that classroom and getting our kids there. So when we can't show appreciation for the bus drivers, for the maintenance and everyone else, th this is an issue. I met a bus driver, 19 years, makes $17 an hour. New hire, $15 an hour. Where's the respect there? Yes, I do agree that we need to pay more. We need to have cut the wasteful spending. Um, and I think that the teachers would love more autonomy into the classroom and more planning time. Teachers that have, especially when they have uh, ESC students, they're teaching classes, they have cases, and they're staying after school for so many hours, they need additional planning time. Um, and finally, the autonomy, I have teachers that can't even put a bird feeder outside their window because admin says no. So, I mean, we need to bring back that innovation for, for teachers and not just teach them like, or act like they're robots. All right, thank you so much. Candidate Kane, same question. Thank you. From teachers and administrators and professionals and students that I have spoken with, I think one of the number one issues is that our teachers are overworked and overstressed and underpaid. Through the pandemic, we expected teachers to, we piled on piles of work, piles of mandates, and as the pandemic came to a close, now we're looking at a 2% learning gap and expecting teachers to make up those gains without additional pay. And I think that overworking them has contributed to a negative culture and a climate that many don't want to remain in if they have an option. Students leaving, I really believe, is the result of that many Many who might not have had an opportunity to experience online learning throughout the pandemic and may have found that it was slightly more successful or didn't approve of the way that it was done, I think that's a place for our innovation in Pinellas County to continue working towards um, making that an effective tool in the classroom. Candidate DeCorti. Okay, I, th I believe that teachers are, employees are leaving. One of the reasons is pay. Um, and I know that the state it has certain guidelines on how we can bargain and all those type of things. So that, that's something we have to work on. But one of the things that teachers are losing, they, they, are, they are not re feeling respected. They are not feeling heard. Uh, and that doesn't just mean teachers. That means all the everybody involved in the educational system. Um, we used to have a climate survey that people could actually get information from. And it was used to change things, to fix things. Teachers and, and employees don't feel they're being listened to. We say things and it just kind of goes, goes over everybody's head. Um, and we do this, things the same way all the time. And that will cause students to leave. They're not getting what they need. The employees, if you can't keep the, the teachers and staff in the schools, then the students, are, the students and their parents are gonna feel, well, they don't need to be there either. 
Uh, so it's, it's a combination of everything. Candidate Benson. Thank you. So I taught during the pandemic. I was a parent that had three kids that were in preschool, kindergarten, and second grade home for eight months during the pandemic. It's been a difficult time. When I think about resourcing, so educators and parents have been facing, we have the fourth highest rental rates in the nation right now. The school district has a very large homeless population with students that they put the data out sometimes on. We think about food insecurity and food deserts that we're facing right now. There are so many resource issues within our county. Even with fantastic partnerships like the Art Club, there are still some clubs that fill up within the first week of school, and those kids are going home alone. And what does that look like? So when I think about some of those things, of course, there's pay parity, not having a living wage, not feeling supported and respected in a sense. So first, I would say advocacy. As a school where we have to think about how can we start thinking about the legislative level, talking about what's going on in Pinellas County and saying these are our needs and this is what we need support in. We also think about training ahead of time. We know that COVID is something else can happen again. Let's not scatter to get it together as we had to before, but let's start training teachers now about how to do this functionality with technology. I think also those strategic partnerships are really important, so gathering with the community. Thank you. All right. Boy, we're, we're great. We've gotten through four questions. We only have 18 more to go. Uh, I'm kidding. You people brought sleeping bags, I hope, right? No, here we go. All right. Uh, some of these questions are a little duplicitous in that you've started to answer them, but trying to get more specific on it. What policies are in place right now to make sure that parents have a say in their children's education, including curriculum? And should these policies be reviewed or expanded? Candidate Martin, go first. You know, I think parental involvement in education is critically important. Um, and having parents knowing what the curriculum is allows for teachers and parents to educate our children in a more collaborative environment. Um, but in order to do that, we need to give our teachers the time to plan parental, you know, plan putting out curriculum in a way that parents can know what's going on. Um, there's a number of policies in Pinellas County Schools, and, and a lot of that addresses some of the divisive issues going on right now. Um, the human sexuality uh, policy in Pinellas County Schools is available online. Um, it's, it's passed down from the, the policies come down from the Tallahassee. Um, every, every parent has to sign a consent form before we teach our kids uh, human sexuality uh, or uh, <laughs> sexual education. Um, so, I mean, I, th I think a lot of the divisive issues are already covered in, in school board policy, and I think we just need to work to communicate that more clearly to uh, parents. Candidate Meyer. Well, thank you for bringing that up, because that's an important point, and I had the pleasure of working with Representative Linda Cheney on that particular bill that Mr. Brian, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Brian Martin just uh, mentioned. Um, so I'm very proud of that. Um, before that bill was passed, um, you had to go make an appointment, go down to the county office to view that curriculum, and once that curriculum was posted online, it was miraculously different. Um, and so I'm very proud of that legislation because it did give parents an opportunity to, to see, um, without leaving their living room, what was actually being taught to their students. And I do think that we need to expand um, those, those provisions that say that parents have more of a say um, in what their students are being taught. I think that um, parents have the right to view any and all curriculum at any time, no questions asked. Um, these are their children. These, these children that are theirs belong to them and no one else. And um, anything that is counter to the values that are being taught in the home, those parents have the right to see and question. All right, candidate Edmund. Oh, no, excuse me, candidate works. My bad, my bad. You my can bad. skip me if you want. I'll take extra time on my, No, my, my pen slipped, okay? Yeah, there you go. Can you uh, please reread that Yeah, for me? the question was, what policies are in place to make sure parents have a say in their children's education, including curriculum, and should these policies be reviewed or expanded? Um, well, the policies come down, of course, from the, um, Tallahassee, then through the Florida Department of Education, and then we have our strategic uh, plan and policies that we have through uh, Pinellas County Schools. Um, we do currently have committees that work with uh, the district regarding our media centers and what um, books are allowed to go through our media centers and what's approved and what's not approved. What I would like to see as a board member, though, have more committees that involve the parents regarding the, the school curriculum. Um, I think that would be um, 
I think that would be very vital, and I think it would make our parents um, and our stakeholders within the district feel more involved with the curriculum that's taking place. So when it's submitted down from uh, businesses or what have you, when it comes in time to, to choose a curriculum for the district, I think that that would be monumentous for us as a district to have more parental involvement in that. But um, as far as specific uh, policies, I can't exactly name one, but we do have policies and procedures in place with our strategic plan. Um, that allow for more parental involvement. Candidate Edmund. I value family and community engagement. I think communication is very important so that people know what they're able to do or know their parental rights. Pinellas County School Board just this year approved the parental rights based on um, the bill signed through the legislature. Uh, I think, again, it's very important that people are aware of their rights, that they get involved and know that if they communicate with their teacher or their child's teacher or administration regarding any concern or question related to curriculum, uh, staff will readily answer their questions. As it relates to um, books, there is a, a committee that reviews books as it relates to their appropriateness and things of that nature. And many of these committees include parents, teachers, business leaders, and folks that are involved. As it relates to reviewing the policy, I think there's always room for improvement, and the public is able to provide feedback related to any policy for consideration. Thank you. Candidate Solanke. Thank you. Yes, parents do have access to review the curriculum, and recent changes have given them even more security. Nothing really has changed. It has just given more security for parental rights. But what I think is also important is that we need to acknowledge the importance of parents and to really open this environment. We want parents involved. The schools that have more active parents tend to perform better. Uh, one thing i like to point out is that I do not agree with the fact that the school board meetings have been um, shut down for live stream when parent commenting comes on. I think this is going against of inviting parents and encouraging parents to speak out. So the live stream sh should be included with the parent commenting as well. Thank you. Candidate Kane. Thank you. This year, I have to second what uh, candidate Edmund just spoke about, which was that the Pinellas County School Board did pass policies that include, that are, uh, were inclusive of some of the bills passed uh, having to do with parental involvement and scholastic transparency. I think we're in a time and in an age where transparency is easier than ever with, uh, with our digital platforms. As a parent, I've personally felt that I've been able to view and see the curriculum that my kids are learning at home easily and from my own computer. Where there's room for improvement here is communication between teachers and parents. Though we have an incredible amount of security in place, it also pushes parents outside the classroom where you have less person-to-person -person conversations with the teachers that are with your student each and every day. I feel that we need to improve upon the culture between parents and teachers because I think overall, the goal is to help our students become educated. Candidate DeCordy. I, I, I believe that the parents do have, have a right to see the curriculum, and I think it's been there. Um, the problem is that sometimes we don't, com we don't communicate how to find it, how to do it, what to do. Um, there are communities in, the, in Pinellas County that may not be that involved, and, it, and we need to reach out to those, pe those, pe those parents, those families, and get them involved. Um, I, I serve on my school SAC committee, and I have three parents that show up for a SAC committee. So those, those parents are, we, we need to do a better job of reaching out and letting them know what's going on. Um, not making it difficult to find stuff. I, I don't think it should be legislated from Tallahassee, however. Um, so that is, a, that's my stance on it. But um, we do need to reach out and make, make sure that people are getting more involved and, and help them. Um, parents need, to, need the help. Uh, there's parents that don't know how to help their students, and that's what we need to, need to be ma making sure that the parents know what's going on so they can help their students. Candidate Benson. Thank you. I'm the parent of three kids in the district. I value communication. I value transparency and accessibility. So as a parent, I do want to know what my children are learning, what the curriculum looks like. And when I think about what that means and what that looks like, with the school district, we know that the Florida statutes are what looks for the curriculum. The district has gone through and done the curriculum several times. Parents have access to what that looks like. Parents should be involved. It should be clear and transparent. I think one of the things for me when it comes to it, though, 
If the curriculum is found to be valid for public education, it should be historically accurate, it should be representative of all the students in our district that we serve. So at the point that a parent has an issue with that curriculum, if it's an issue that's not valid educationally, then I think that's where parent choice comes in. So as parents, we have the option. We can send our kids to a charter school or a private school or somewhere else. But when you're talking about public education and public funds, that curriculum should be representative of the whole. And when we look at what those options look like, people ask me what I think about charter schools or private schools. I have no issue. But for me, if you're using public funds, you should be accountable to those funds, and you should be really transparent with how that is even used. And it should be inclusive for all students. Thank you. Candidate Zimmerman. We've always had policy in place uh, for parents to be part of their children's education and to know what's going on. The problem is that we have never really made it easy for that to take place. So communication is the key. Uh, I believe that what we should do on our website is that we should have every course that's taught in Pinellas County Schools with a link right there so you could see the standards for that particular course. The standards are set by the state of Florida. Uh, as are all the textbooks that we use. We get to choose from a selection of textbooks that have been pre-approved by the state. Uh, when a parent objects to something, it's pretty clear in statute, especially with the last three bills that came through this year, uh, and we simply abide by that. But do I believe it should take place? Should we have policy for parents to be part of it? Absolutely. All right, here we go, another question. We have seen tremendous progress over the last several years in narrowing the achievement gap for African American and other minority students. How are you going to make sure that progress continues? Candidate Meyer, you're first. Well, I think that we need to ensure that um, we are looking at the programs that have been beneficial and that we continue to fund, fully fund those programs that are working. And then we need to look at programs that aren't working and haven't historically worked and not continue to fund them and make sure that we are redirecting those funds to the classroom where it counts um, to our students and to our teachers. Um, so I am very happy to see the latest news that's, that has come out that the achievement gap has not gotten any worse um, in Pinellas County and, and overall over Florida, uh, despite the fact that we had our schools shut down and many of our early, early learners were wearing masks and our teachers were wearing masks during a time that's very critical to their education. Um, so I think we just need to stay the course, but I do think that you know we still have, as, as uh, Maria brought up, we do still have some serious issues as it relates to um, early learning and literacy and, and, and those things. And so we do need to address those um, okay. as well. Candidate Works. Um, as part of my research for running for, uh, during my candidacy, I've been attending the school board workshops that are open to the public. And uh, as, as part of that, they have been going over the strategic plan as of last year's and then the amendments that they're making for the new one. And I was very, very happy to see that that gap is seriously closing. The graduation rates between the years of 2013 to 2020 two um, have improved, um, almost doubled um, from 2013. So the graduation rates um, from our white to non-white students is down to the single digits for the first time. So I think that is amazing, amazing feat for our students. So our graduation rates are anywhere between 88.9, I believe, to 92%, which is absolutely phenomenal for our students, and I think that's fantastic. Is there still work to do? Absolutely. Um, and I think that if we continue on the road that we're on and continue continue to implement um, the uh, work that we've done in those schools. Uh, we had six schools that rated in a, um, oh, I apologize. No, that's all right. <laughs> if you have questions, ask me. <laughs> okay. Candidate Edmund. Would you please repeat the question? Okay. We've seen tremendous progress over the last several years in narrowing the achievement gap for African American and other minority students. How are you going to make sure that progress continues? Something I've done as a current school board member is really looking at the data for all of our goals and asking questions. Are we really measuring this goal accurately? What metrics are we using? Is there something we can do better? As it relates to reading, questioning the curriculum, yes, we have a consultant that provided support with our um, district staff with creating the curriculum, but is it really addressing the phonemic and phonological concerns that I'm hearing across the board from all um, teachers and some parents as it relates to reading skills? And when we look at the graduation rate, yes, it is closing. That gap is closing. 
But are they graduating and ready for a career in life? Are they reading proficiently? Those are some of the concerns that I'm hearing and actually that I'm concerned about. So I look forward to continuing to work with staff, ask questions, provide solutions, and I think it's important to advertise the great work occurring with Pinellas Education Foundation in several initiatives. Thank you. Candidate Kane. All right, thank yeah, you, sir. Yeah, our, yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Solanke had to leave, so oh, we're, so we're sorry. good, yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, how do we continue in the success of narrowing the achievement gap? Uh, a quote that stands out to me is, a rising tide lifts all ships. Uh, we need to continue to strive in Pinellas County, and one of my favorite things that was said during our interviews for the incoming superintendent was that we need to become an A school district. We need to keep striving because that success is not just one person's success. It's the district's success. It is success for all. We need to keep our eyes focused on 100% student success for all students, regardless of background and regardless um, of who they are or where they live. We need to continue to focus on that, and that will continue to close the gap, and that will continue to bring success to our students. Candidate DeCordy. Okay. Um Closing the gap, this, this once again goes back to the equity issue, um, that students are getting what they, what they need to succeed. Um, and not every, not, we, we, we don't seem to be doing that to all students. And that comes back again, once I keep saying, parental and community involvement. Um, we need to teach, we need to help have parents that they can help their students. Um, it's not, it's, it, you know, we say it's a, you know, it's a, it takes a village. You know, um, so we need to do that. We need to be more involved in the community with early, ed early learning situations, um, helping parents that don't know how to get the help for their kid, get them the help they need. We need to be in the equity so that everybody gets what they need to succeed. Um, what helps Johnny doesn't necessarily help Joey. So we need to make sure that we get Johnny what he needs and Joey what he needs. Thank you. Candidate Benson. So when I think about public education, I think about social mobility and generational advancement. So are students coming out with a living wage? Are they ready for the workforce? Are they ready for what's next? Can they live here and can they be successful? People keep telling me that I don't have kids. It doesn't matter. This is our future generation, our future workforce, the things that we have here. So when we think about the gap, I'm big on data. And we have to disaggregate that data across race and see what's truly happening. Yes, the rates have improved, but have they truly improved? Taking a look at some of those graduation rates, are we just pushing children through, or are they truly ready for the outcomes that are coming next for this? So looking deeply at that data, understanding it better, seeing how our children are performing on the other side of this, I think is important. When the school district went away from the busing model, they went to a neighborhood school model, and they were told, you will have to resource differently across the district. And they said, great, we'll do that, but not quite. And that's when we went into the failure factories in those neighborhood school models. So thinking about what are those resource needs, how does equity take place, and how do we ensure that every child has what they need and those teachers at those schools as well? We have to really think about what this consideration is. Thank you. Candidate Zimmerman. One of the things that's really worked is <clears throat> pull-out tutoring. That's where a child isn't meeting the, the level that they need to meet. They're taken out of classes that are often elective classes, and they're given individual tutoring, and that's worked well. Uh, another thing that we need to do is, first of all, we have to address the individual needs. Why is this child not successful? Is it something that they're bringing in from the outside? Is it their home? Were they deprived of something that we can then supplement and bring them up to par? Um, we need to look at fourth grade, and fourth grade we know that if a child doesn't know basic math skills by fourth grade, they're going to fail for the rest of their school career. So we need to address that and make sure that they are up to speed in fourth grade. Um, we also need to bring up the attendance rate. We have a tremendous attendance problem, and the pandemic has made it far worse. So we have to appeal to their interests, their avocational interests. What are they interested in now? And we need to use that to get them to show up. Thank you. And candidate Martin. Can you repeat the question? Uh, we've seen tremendous progress over the last several years narrowing the achievement gap for African American and minority students. How are you gonna make sure that progress continues? So there's a six part bridging the gap plan in Pinellas County Schools. Um, and some of the parts have had tremendous success, notably the graduation rates. Um, in 2016, 2017, there was a 30% gap between our minority students and white students. 
Uh, and that has come up consistently, and now there's a 7% gap. Um, but where, as Dr. Benson pointed out, we're lacking in some of the other areas. Um, student achievement, uh, test scores amongst our minority students, five years ago, there was a 30% gap. Today, there's still a 30% gap. 18% um, of our student population is black, brown, or minority, um, yet they account for 50% of the out-of-school suspensions and 50% of the arrests in our schools. So we need to make sure that we're looking at ways to improve that. Um, uh, minority hiring, so the goals strategic plan was to have our teachers and staff reflect the 18% minority status of our students. And in 2016-17, we had 7%. In the last five years, we've only raised that to 9%. So we're doing a good job, but there's still a lot of work to be done. All right, I'm just at ending my own question here. Um, what are your financial priorities in addressing teacher, bus driver, and support staff shortages in salaries and making sure all the schools have sufficient resources, knowing that schools that have strong PTAs are always more economically advantaged than other schools, and I say that as a lifetime PTA member and having seen it through my whole career. So again, getting back to what are your financial priorities with all of the big problems that we've got to face, and they're problems, but they're something that the school board has to deal with. And we'll start out with candidate works. Can you repeat that for me one more time? Yeah, well, I was asking the financial priorities in addressing teacher, bus driver, and support staff shortages and salaries and making sure that all the schools have sufficient resources, knowing that some schools with strong PTAs have more resources than others. Um, I have been a member of the PTA and working with the PTA for a very uh, a lot of years, actually. So, and a lot of that comes with parental involvement. Um, now, as far as the district will give all of the schools the same resources. But the thing is, is even though those resources are given to every school, it has to be based on what does that specific school need? That, if when you look at the schools individually, this that, let's just say one school may need more people, it may need more time, it may need more resources. So even though everything is divvied out to every school equally, each individual school may need more resources. So that needs to be reviewed. That's something that needs to be looked at. Um, so regardless of how everything is allotted to each individual school, if one school needs more resources, it may even be time. So um, we can't just say, well, we gave everybody the same thing, so off you go. They may need more community um, involvement as well. All right, candidate Edmund. I think, it's, I think it's important to let the public know that as it relates to salary and pay, we are bounded by state statute as it relates to those negotiations. However, I do believe all staff deserve a raise. I believe veteran professionals as well as uh, bus drivers should make a living wage and uh, the compression needs to be addressed. That's something that we as a school board can do by speaking with our legislators. As it relates to sufficient resources to all schools, we can do that by understanding that there's tiered levels of support. So if a school is labeled low performing, they'll receive additional resources, or maybe they're a part of the transformation zone. So they'll receive additional support financially um, from the state because of their school grade. Uh, and then depending on the student body makeup, they'll receive additional funds, whether uh, due to the ESE population. I think it's, I look forward to talking to you more about that. <laughs> <laughs> I know these are complicated <laughs> subjects. <laughs> yeah, all right. Candidate Kate, same thing. Yes, that's a tough one in a minute. First and foremost, I have to say, bus drivers and support staff absolutely need a raise. They, they need a living wage, they need to be able to to survive on the pay that they're getting and also have competitive pay in the job field that they're in. And that's teachers, support staff, and bus drivers. But I think bus drivers, in that we are currently experiencing a shortage, we absolutely need to focus on them and uh, making sure that they're up to par. Making sure that schools have sufficient resources across the, uh, across the county is, is a tougher one, because as you mentioned, schools with strong PTAs have a strong amount of support. And if a school doesn't have a lot of support coming in in that way, I think that um, one way to tackle that would be to create partnerships with our community surrounding the school businesses, with uh, 
places like the Pinellas Ed Foundation does a lot for schools in this situation, but we could reach outside of that to additional um, business owners and community members who are willing to help those schools in need. Candidate DeCorty, same question. Okay, um, when it comes to the pay, um, it, 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 is, it is fault, it is a problem. I, uh, um, one of our support staff showed me her check one time. I couldn't believe that that's what she lives on. Um, so they, the support staff, bus drivers, maintenance, cafeteria workers, they all need uh, an increase, uh, however we can find it. <clears throat> and uh, and as, as a teacher, I would say teachers also. Um, but when it comes to the, the, the schools, it is, it is difficult. Um, and I know my sons were in the band. At, we raised a lot of money to be in the band at Tarpon Springs. But not every community can do that. Um, so that's when we need to reach out to, um, like was said, communities, uh, the, the businesses around, around certain schools to try to get help for those, for those local schools in that area, even if it's not in their area, but to help out as much as they can for a school, take, adopt a school, um, whatever it might be, so they can get resources that they need. Candidate Benson. Thank you. So for me, I think it's a lot of it's been said already, making sure that our support staff and our teachers have a living wage. And in order to do that, sometimes we will have to advocate for legislation to change some of those rules at the state level. I think also considering the fact that we have to get innovative. We have to bring in strategic partnerships to make money stretch. So the school district has one of the largest landowners, if not the largest in the county. Um, how do we get into the housing market? How do we start talking about affordable housing and rental rates? How do we incentivize teachers or school personnel in that way? I know that when I lived in Philadelphia, they gave teachers tax abatements for living within the community and what that looked like. So we can think about what that looks like. Also considering, we talked about adopt a center here. When I was at Thrive by Five Pinellas, we talked to local business leaders and said, can you adopt an early childhood center? Can you give them something in kind, marketing support, or how to do um, the next piece of work for them in their education of that? So, but it has to happen at the school district system level. I think right now we have a lot of different programs that are like, I go to this school, I go to that school, I tutor here. But coming at the school district level, finding these programs and partnerships, and how do we let that trickle down to make sure that all schools have the resources met for them? And candidate Zimmerman. One of the problems with equal distribution, I know what my financial problems is, uh, the question here, uh, what my financial priorities is, the question. But one of the problems that we have with equal distribution of funds is that PTAs are stronger at some schools. Countryside High School, where I spent most of my, almost my entire career, uh, had a very good PTA, but more important, they had a, a very large community that supported the school. Uh, I could raise money for my program very quickly by selling things that I needed to sell, and parents would buy them because they had the money. I think one of the things we need to do is the Education Foundation is outstanding. And as a school board member, I'd want to work closely with the Education Foundation to raise money from the outside so that we could then distribute that money with our recommendation. They could distribute that money to the areas where there are higher needs. Candidate Martin. So we talked a little bit earlier about the teacher pay. So um, I know the board on July 12th voted to increase bus driver pay, which I think is a great move to try and uh, close some of the gap there and bring more bus drivers into the field to reduce some of that. Um, I think that should be extended to the support staff um, and substitutes. Um, in terms of teacher pay, I think we need to advocate to the legislature to increase school funding. The $800 million statewide budget addition to schools brought Florida from the bottom five to the bottom seven in teacher pay. So there's still a lot to be done there. Um, Bus driver hours are also a little awkward. They have a three to four hour block in the morning and then a two, three hour gap for their afternoon routes. Um, so we need to treat people like people and give them real jobs that you know, take up their, their time. Uh, and I'm fortunate that I go to, my kids go to schools with active and vibrant PTAs. They'll have fundraisers that raise 30, 40, $50,000. Um, but we need to, as, as Brad mentioned earlier, some other PTAs to get three parents to come. Uh, we need to work on community partnerships to get some of those, you know, schools more more resources. And candidate Meyer. Thank you. So I absolutely 100% agree that we do need to ensure that we are uh, giving our our those of our, the I'm sorry the members of our community who are working in these roles um, the. Uh, security, right? The financial security that they need to ensure that um, they can provide for themselves and their families. Um, so I am 100% in, in favor of increasing um, their pay. But I also think that it's important that we address some of the issues. Um, 
I go back to discipline because um, I've talked to a lot of bus drivers who have talked about and told me about the discipline issues on the bus. Um, nobody wants to be the only adult on a bus with you know, 25 screaming out of control kids. So again, there needs to be um, strong discipline, there needs to be consequences for this behavior. Um, and then additionally, in our areas where we don't have a strong PTA, we need to really lean on our communities. Um, and that's where I think it's important that our board members have ties to our communities, they have ties to our legislative legislators um, and other leaders in the community. All right, we've avoided the word politics until now. <laughs> <laughs> we have a strong history of being respectful and collaborative. How do you plan on continuing this work relationship with the superintendent and other board members without politics getting in the way and be specific if possible? Candidate Edmund. <laughs> So, being on the board, I, I think it's important to share that we have worked collaboratively. And it's okay to agree to disagree. Um, that's the point of having a board. We all were elected. We all are entitled to uh, share information and provide our stance on issues. And again, we, we have uh, Mrs. Kane here. And again, it's, we, I just think it's important to share that we work together. No one board member accomplishes anything alone. It's required that you have the majority of the board's vote. So the deep discussions, they occur at our workshops where that's the opportunity for people to say how they feel about various policies or um, various things of concerns. And then when we walk out, you have the opportunity to vote how you like to vote. So I really like working with my colleagues. I feel that it's been uh, very collaborative. And, and I plan on continue to do that. Okay, and candidate Kane, since she mentioned you, you're next. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, how do we avoid bringing the politics in? You listen. I think the first thing you need to do is listen. So don't, don't talk and listen and be respectful of all points of view that are coming to the table and understand that your colleagues and those you're working with um, are highly respected in their field and they come in with their own perspective and their own knowledge and we need to take that in before making decisions and we need to have those open conversations. So communication after listening is vital. I come from a fairly large family and that's when things get out of hand, when people stop listening to the other person's point of view or diminish it in some way. And so I think all people at the table are valued and we must listen to those points of view and we must come to a consensus. And sometimes we do agree to disagree and that can be reflected in the vote. Thank you. Candidate DeCorti. Um, when working with other people, it's the, the thing is to remember the goal. And the goal for the school board and the district is the success of our students and the success of our schools. So that, as long as we, ha we need to make sure that we have the, the central goal and we, we understand what that goal is. Um, you're not gonna, get, in, a, in a situation like this, you don't get everything you want. So you have to be able to compromise. You have to be able to understand what other people need and want. Um, so we have to be able to work together and understand um, that we are the leaders, that the school board you know, has to be the leaders with the, with the superintendent. And when you know it, we can't make we can't be doing you know ridiculous things because we we are the we are the ones that people look to uh, will be the ones that look to and that goal is is of vital importance making sure that we understand and keep politics out of it and just remember what the goal is and that's the success of our students. Candidate Benson. So I consider myself to be an inclusive leader. I've worked across communities um, for the past 20 years or so, and I believe in bringing others to the table and elevating voices. I am fine with conflict. Some people run away from conflict. I think conflict breeds innovation. As long as we can have respectful discourse and talk back and forth, I've contacted most of the school board members and said, introduce myself, and we've had conversations that we may not agree on everything, and that's okay. But I think um, there was a school board member named Lou Williams. He passed away. And I remember him saying, keep the main thing the main thing, and the main thing is the kids. And if we come back to the main thing is the kids, we can always find common ground there. I think for me in the communication pattern, I always think about communication as an iceberg. And right now we have a lot of noise, we have a lot of anger, we have a lot of, but what's underneath that? You know, even those groups that come to school board meetings and are very upset, what are their core concerns? They still care about their children, they still wanna advocate for their children. So let's have those conversations. And I think when we go back to the main thing, 
we have the core concerns, and we remember that politics has no place in schools. There's no time and no space for this, and we have to work together for the kids. I think we'll be fine. Candidate Zimmerman. This is one of my best traits. Uh, when I was in the legislature, I was able to work across the aisle almost every single time. Uh, I think it begins with listening, as what's been brought up, but it also really, the emphasis is on hearing. You know, if you understand and hear, I, there were bills that I voted on that I never, ever in a million years thought I would vote on, but when I heard the rationale behind it, it made sense. So as Brad said, you know, our focus is on students and on student success. And as long as we always have that as our go back to, I think we can easily get along regardless of our political beliefs. And candidate Martin. School board elections are nonpartisan elections for a reason. Uh, Republicans, Democrats, independents alike all support a strong public education. Um, and the, the fact is that we all agree on 95 plus percent of the issues. Um, the school board is a team. Um, I've spent the last 15 years working on very politically diverse teams on complex problems. And you know what, you, you listen to all the sides, you take in information, and, and you, you compromise where you need to. Um, the school board unanimously elected the superintendent, so I, I don't think we're going to have any problems uh, working with Mr. Hendricks. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a great person. I think a lot of us are, are happy that he's the superintendent. Um, and so I just think that, you know, we keep politics out and, you know, Pinellas County voted largely in favor of not having politically motivated school board elections. Candidate Meyer. What's best for our children transcends party lines, and that needs to be the motivating factor in everything that a school board member does. Obviously, many people have different ideas how to attain the same goals. Um, however, it is important that you work and collaborate with your colleagues in order to get to that goal. Um, one of the things that I think is important about me personally and professionally is the fact that I spent 17 years in the sales and marketing world prior to becoming a teacher. Um, and getting into education. Um, my time at specifically Procter & Gamble, um, we worked collaboratively. We had to deliver for our customers. As you know, for, uh, Procter & Gamble is a Fortune 100 company. Um, you don't get to where I did with Procter & Gamble if, you, if you're not working with your colleagues, if you're not working with your, your business partners and, and your strategic team in order to deliver. And that's exactly what I plan to do, to work with my colleagues. I've been reaching out to the school board members um, to meet with them individually as well. Um, and just trying to build that bridge and, and build those partnerships now. Candidate Works. Um, I have been strictly staying down that nonpartisan line since the beginning. Um, I, if I am not invited to a forum, I reach out to them because I want it to be understood throughout this community that I am for every single one of your children, your children, your grandchildren, whoever you know, that anything, anyone that you have in this public district, I am advocating for them. Um, regardless of how you feel, regardless of your political lines, I am advocating for your child. Um, anyone that's known me since I've moved here can I can back that up. Um, I don't believe in one size fits all politics, um, but I, I have never liked this political process. And there, and again, like Mr. Martin said, um, the school board uh, candidacies are non partisan for a reason. Um, and some of us have met at other forums and we've taken pictures together and we've talked, we've helped each other with signs and we've gotten along very well. And I think that that um, being collaborative and being able to um, be around each other in the same environment is a wonderful trait that we've all had during this candidacy. Uh, here we go. All right. Uh, in the olden days, reading, writing, and arithmetic, which is weird because they called it the three R's and arithmetic, as far as I know, doesn't start with an R. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, but these days, teachers need to be counselors. They need to know how to handle emergency situations. They, uh, you deal with so much with broken families, absentee fathers, food insecurities. You've mentioned all of these things. So how do you make sure the district is meeting those social emotional needs of the students? And what I think I'm trying to get in on that question is, <clears throat> if you can't measure it, you don't know how to fix it. Mm -hmm. So let's start out that way with how you're going to measure it and how you're going to fix it for all these emotional and social needs that you must deal with. We start out with candidate Kane. Thank you so much. That, that's a tough question to do in a minute. But I think that 
we need to first identify what the social emotional needs are in each individual classroom because that changes uh, depending on your geography in the district. It also depends on which students that you have in your particular classroom and what needs that they specifically have. The culture is something that on day one, our teachers establish with their students the culture of that classroom and the climate and the mood and the level of communication between teacher and student. That is strongly in the teacher's hand. And I believe that we need to encourage teachers to have open communication with students. We need to identify, find pragmatic ways of identifying those social emotional needs and how we can better meet them to make sure that students are progressing in their education. And it is a lot to ask of teachers to be all of these things to all of these students all at once. So I think we need to continue supporting them and, and providing um, education for them in the future. Candidate DeCordy. Okay, <clears throat> this comes down to what, what we talk about uh, a lot of times in the groups I'm in, uh, about relationships. And the relationships you have with students and other teachers and, and administration, it's all, it's all part of, of building a, a close relationship and an understanding of each other. Um, and, it, you know, and knowing that they, letting the students know that they can come and talk to you, they, they, you can, they can trust you. Um, and that's, building that trust is a very important uh, concept in, in education. Um, when I have, you know, in my class, I have six classes of 25 people, 25 students, so I have to kind of be able to read all of the different students and build relationships with all of them, um, kind of find out interests. And, and once I get the relationships, then it seems to work a lot better once they understand who I am, uh, let them know who I am, and then I figure out who they are and what they need uh, to succeed. And that's where I need to, that's what we need to do. So all right, relationships. Candidate, Candidate Benson, same question. I think first and foremost, valuing social emotional learning and understanding the importance of that in schools. When people talk about going back to the basics and the things they want to see there, children need social emotional learning skills. I'm a parent of three kids that are under the age of 10. We deal with a lot of big feelings. And I think thinking back to Parkland and why they started having social emotional learning in schools in the first place and actually giving it time to track what that looks like. I worked on something called a school success profile when I was in my PhD program, and we actually looked at what did neighborhood violence look like, what did homelessness look like, and we had dashboards. And parents were able to actually have a report to say, this is what your kids are facing right now, and districts can do things around that and policies. We can have those kind of dashboards here in Pinellas County as well. I also think about partnerships. And me, parenting isn't just me. It is me and the community and others and schools coming together to help with my children. So looking at what that partnership piece looks like and that we're informing each other and communicating along the way. I think the other piece for me is just resourcing, making sure that our students, going back to equity guys, making sure that they have what they need, whether they're gifted students, EL students, whatever their needs are, meeting those needs where we are in this place. Candidate Zimmerman. I've been married 39 years, and I think the reason why it's been so successful is all the advice I've given to students uh, over the past 33 years on their breakups with, you know, their boyfriend or girlfriend. <laughs> uh, uh, teachers do participate in this way. Teachers are involved. Uh, I've had over 5,000 students, and I think virtually every one of them felt comfortable coming to me and when they needed me, when they needed that advice. The biggest problem, though, as a, as a school system, is that there are no other pathways. There, are no, there isn't a reference group for us to send those students to when they really need it, with the exception of abuse. We all, all teachers know what to do if a child's being abused. But when a child's been, you know, is heartbroken, is almost suicidal, but not quite, we don't have that pathway because we don't have the counselors. So we need to develop that pathway. Every teacher needs to know how to deal with it. Candidate Martin. So we talked about food insecurity. Um, Pinellas County just lost access to the national school lunch and breakfast. Um, so that, that's, that's a, I think that's a big problem. Um, there are still free and reduced lunch programs, but families feel like there's a loss in dignity in applying for them, so, so some don't bother. Um, if a student is hungry in class, then you know, they're not going to be paying attention and it affects behavior. Um, students, if they don't feel safe in class, they're not going to be able to pay attention and their, their attention is going to be divided. Um, we need to increase access to the mental health services. Um, giving kids more access to counselors can kind of help work through some of these emotional problems. Uh, getting more social workers to find out core, core reasons why families are struggling and then can help them find the resources in the community to try and resolve some of these issues. 
When we're talking about teachers being counselors, um, we're, we're hiring a lot of new, new teachers. Veteran teachers are the ones that can look around the classroom and identify issues. Our, our new teachers aren't, don't have, won't have developed those skills yet, so trying to keep our veteran teachers in class to train the new teachers on how to look for signs and symptoms. Candidate Meyer. Can you repeat the question? What would you do to make sure the district is meeting the social emotional needs of the students? Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, I think as a teacher, one of the most important things that we do for our students beyond teaching them whatever the subject matter is that we are there to teach is to provide a safe, empathetic space for them um, where they can just learn and they can and they can thrive. And so I think one of the first things that we do have to do as teachers is get to know our students, provide empathy for them, listen to them. Um, but I also think that we you know, we have to look at all of these bigger picture issues and, and look and see what can we do to find solutions. So we all know that there is an issue with our students. You know, one of the things I think quickly that we can do is remove cell phones from classrooms. This is such a distraction for our students. Um, you know, they're, they're distracted by them and, you know, they're not paying attention in class and all of these things cause our kids anxiety. A lot of the bullying that is going on is being done over social media and with the use of cell phones. So while they're at school, you know, give them that that space, you know, to kind of get away from some of those things. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I have 13 grandkids. Tell me about this. All right. Uh, Ms. Works, you had that question. Um, I don't believe there's any, like, cookie-cutter educational style that our teachers can have. I believe that um, they're very smart, very trained individuals and I think that they should have full autonomy in their classroom. They know these kids and um, they can sense what they need and I think that we should give them the full autonomy to teach their classrooms. Um, they build relationships with these students. Um, I even spoke to the Sierra Club the other day and I was telling them, you know, if there's students that are uh, concerned about the environment and want to make a club, let's let them make a club for that. You know, let, we make those things available for our students that, that make them feel like they're, um, or let them them make a, a difference in their lives. Um, now, I, I know uh, I appreciate anybody that goes into education like Mrs. Meyer and um, uh, Ms. Edmund have, but um, I think that the public school system may be uh, a little bit different because there are students that transient students, we have educational um, ESC <coughs> students, uh, so the, the type of students that we have in the public system are very different, but I think our education or our educators can definitely um, use their autonomy for our students. All right, candidate Edmund. I mentioned this earlier, addressing the needs of the whole child mm -hmm. is extremely important, and that includes social emotional learning. Some of the things that the district has done is partnered. You know, we have food pantries at several of our schools. We partner with Evara Health and the health department to have health departments within um, high schools throughout the county. And expanding those partnerships Communicating with families so that they know that these services are available, that is going to be extremely important. We also know that mental health is at top of mind of several people or several organizations, and there's a great strength. So finding a provider for a child or even an adult at this time is really hard. So what I think we can do as a board is advocate advocate for additional funding and additional resources so that we can hire more mental health professionals so that we can expand those great partnerships. Um, I, okay. <laughs> well, we've, uh, we've went through nine questions here. We didn't get to 10, but uh, uh, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. We thought we would go till about 7.40. Well, it's 7.40 right now when we're going to be moving into our closing statements. Uh, just so that people can understand the breakup of who's running against who, simply because I, you can't see the numbers very well. Uh, District 2, raise your hand. So those two are running against each other, correct? Yes. Okay, and District 3, those two are running against each other. Now, if I've forgotten a candidate or somebody didn't show up, let me know. I, I'm, we're missing a candidate yeah, in our we're race. We're, we're missing one, too. Don Peters. You're missing, so there was a third person in that yes. race? Okay, that's good to know. Uh, District six, three, is there anybody else missing? No. Nope, okay. And District seven, there we go. <laughs> okay, that, I made that clear as mud, didn't I? Oh, well. So we went ahead and, and uh, kind of 
just decided for the closing order we would just go right down the line. So, candidate, you have a minute to give us a give us your best pitch about why you think you should be on the school board. Lisa Kane, we start with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I I believe that I am a good candidate for the school board because I truly do get to see the district's issues from a variety of perspectives, and I think it's very unique and a unique voice on the board. Next year, I'll have students, I'll have a high schooler, a middle schooler, and two in elementary. I get a really wide perspective of what's happening in our district, and not only that, but I teach over 200 students throughout our community at all grade levels and from all different schools. I get a really nice perspective on what is happening, and every single day when I wake up, I absolutely try to make the best decisions possible for each and every one of them, for my students and for your children and grandchildren and for their long-term future. Um, in addition to that, I have been endorsed by the Firefighters Union, by the Police Benevolent Society, and also ABC Builders and Contractors because they know um, how important it is to me to not only keep our kids safe, but provide them career-oriented education that will help them well into their future. Thank you so much. Candidate Brad DeCorti. Okay, you have a minute. thank you. Um, I am, uh, I, I, like I said before, I've been a, uh, a classroom teacher. I'm still a classroom teacher uh, for the last 22 years at Tarpon Springs Middle School. Um, I've been an advocate up in Tallahassee. I meet with people around the state through the uh, Florida Education Association. So I see what, what solutions come from other parts of Florida. And I also have met uh, with people in the nationals. National Education Association, so I see what solutions we might have for problems f around the country. Um, I don't have two, st two boys in the school system right now. They're both graduated, but they did go through the public schools. I did uh, f go through, th through that with them and th as their band program and things like that. Um, so it's, it's a lot of experience being around uh, the students in the class as a teacher, knowing the, what the support staff goes through, the maintenance, the cafeteria workers, uh, talking to bus drivers, uh, everybody that's involved in the school, I talk to them all the time. Keith Benson, you have a closing statement for us. So they talk about school boards being battleground states right now in places. Um, for me, it's not about a position, it's not about politics, it's about serving our children. I had a great job that I resigned from in February to run for school board because I care this much about it. I'm a parent, I've been an educator for over a decade now. I've led in this county. So I've worked with 90 plus organizations around equitable economic development. I've worked with the Ed Foundation. I've worked with JWA and others to do system level work around early childhood and education in this county. When I think about this, I've been endorsed at the, thank you so much, at the state level by SEIU Florida, 80,000 union members behind me and supporting me in this campaign. Also, when I look at this, it is Equality Florida, Florida National Organization for Women, the Public Education Caucus of Florida, the Police and Benevolent Association. I work across the board with people. I am an inclusive leader, and I'm excited to do this work and serve our kids. I go back to, I stand for all children. I stand for all children, and I will advocate for the needs of every child. When I think about what this looks like for me, the board has opportunity. Thank you. All right, great. Glad to know everybody's still got some gas left in their tanks after this, okay? <laughs> Candidate Carl Zimmerman. I'm the only one in this particular race that's actually worked in the classroom, K through 12, public schools, and Pinellas County schools. Uh, my life has been education. My degrees are in education. I have a master's and a bachelor's degree. Uh, I served in the legislature, as I said before, on three education committees. I chose that because I wanted to affect change on the legislative level. And I'll tell you that the way to affect change on the legislative level is to not lobby the legislature, it's to lobby the businesses that have influence on the legislature. That's um, true, that's true. My, uh, as I said, my career has been in education and I know what works and I know what doesn't work. I have lived through all the different trials and errors for the last 33 years. And I want to bring that knowledge to be able to make on-the-spot decisions with the superintendent that are going to bring our kids back from the tremendous learning loss they've suffered in the last two and a half years. And I'd like to say, but I can't, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Brian M. Martin, you have a minute. Local elections are important, and I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, we talked a lot about a lot of key issues tonight. And I'm running for school board as the father of four students enrolled in Pinellas County Public Schools. Um, I'm running to be a full-time school board member uh, with a focus on improving public education for all children and families in the community. I'm running to advocate for our ESE students and families. 
I'm running to improve school safety, increase parental involvement. I'm running to advocate for our parents, families, teachers, staff, everyone. Um, I've been endorsed by the Pinellas Classroom Teachers Association, Pinellas Educational Support Professionals, Florida Education Association, Equality Florida, the National Organization for Women in Florida, Florida Freedom to Read, uh, SEIU. Um, I, I believe I'm the candidate for District 6, and I thank you all for your time. All right, candidate Stephanie Meyer. Thank you, and thank you to everyone who's here tonight and who is invested in this important decision um, coming up on August 23rd. So in addition to my teaching experience, which is both in the private and public school system, um, I want to clarify that. I think there may be some misconceptions there. I do teach in a private school, but I also teach at Hillsborough Community College, where I'm an adjunct professor of history, where I teach dual enrolled students at Leto High School. So I am teaching in a K through 12 school. So in addition to that, I spent 17 years um, in sales and marketing, and I think that's what makes me the most qualified candidate because not only do I have education experience, but I also have experience managing billions of dollars uh, with P&G for my clients and my customers and other um, companies during that 17 year time. Um, I'm a lifelong member here of Pinellas County. I grew up in our schools in Pinellas County. My mom was a 34 year veteran teacher with Pinellas County. I've seen how much our schools have changed over the years and I wanna advocate for every child in our community. All right, Kimberly Works, you have a minute. Thank you all so much for coming and all of you that are watching. Um, I believe I'm the only candidate in District 6 that was actually a parent in the district when Dr. Grego came to be our superintendent. So I've already seen this shift of a new superintendent coming in to the district. And I've also seen Dr. Hendricks in action at our workshops. Um, I have been attending the school board meetings and workshops. So I've been studying um, how the school board works. And I think that is very, very essential for a school board member to do prior to taking a position. Um, I also want to make Make it known that prior to my name being Works, my name was my last name was Nance during uh, my time of advocating through the district. Just in case anyone is confused, <laughs> um, and I also have pledged and spoken to my husband, I will be resigning from my position with my company if um, elected to be able to devote my full time attention as a school board member to advocate for your children. So I think that is important for everyone to know. Should I be elected, I will be devoting my full time attention to Pinellas County School Board and my responsibilities. Thank you. And Caprice Edmond, our final candidate tonight. Thank you all for being here and thank you partners and sponsors for hosting this wonderful event. I am a parent, former educator and former guardian at Lightham, as well as a certified school board member through Florida School Boards Association. I currently serve on the board of directors for Florida School Boards Association, representing my colleagues in Pinellas County. It has been my honor to serve and represent constituents throughout the county as it relates to policies and procedures and advocating for the things that matters. And that, ensures, and that is ensuring that we have 100% student success. Our campaign has been endorsed by PCTA PESPA, Equality Florida, Suncoast PBA, the Firefighter Association, Pinellas Realtor Organ Organization, and so much more. But what is most important is that you vote on August 23rd. For additional information, please visit my website, edmundforeducation.com. <laughs> you know, the rest of you didn't get in your, your sites. You should have thought of that. Well, well, I just want to say that, you know, I, I have probably hosted... What was that? <laughs> Did I do something wrong? Okay, anyway, I, I have hosted, as you know, uh, through the years, probably a dozen of these things with different candidates and stuff, and I have to say that, that this is probably one of the most impressive group of people that have been running for this office that I've seen in a long time. So I want, on behalf of the audience here, how difficult people don't realize it is running for public office. And I personally want to thank you for wanting to run and put yourself through the nightmare of a candidacy <laughs> and wish you all the best in everything that you do. And now I'd like to turn it back over to our good friend, Kimberly Jackson, and the ISPS folks who allow me to pretend I still know what I'm doing. Kimberly, thank you so much. <laughs> Seriously, thank you. Thank you for asking thoughtful questions in a way that allows the candidates to answer 
concerns that constituents have. That is what ISPS does best. We want to hear your voices, whatever that is. So I want to thank you all for participating in an excellent forum. I want to thank our partners again for working with us. The Pinellas Education Foundation, the League of Women Voters of North Pinellas County and St. Petersburg area and Pinellas County Council of PTA. As many of you all said, we have an election coming. It's August 23rd. Um, I have my big boss back there, so I want to acknowledge him, our Vice President, Dr. Matthew Leo Troth, but we have um, created a voters education series for our students because our students are your students. It's really just all one pipeline. You have no idea how many students walk through our hallways that are still connected to the Pinellas County school system. So to come to that one-stop um, source of education, please go to isps.spcollege.edu forward slash vote. Again, that's isps.spcollege.edu forward slash vote. I think the most important sentiment that has um, been expressed tonight is service and understanding what you have the power to do, which is listen to the candidates and who wants to serve you, and it is service and then make a decision based on your thought process and what you believe is best for our county. Al, thank you so much. Thank you. Candidates, thank you so much. Partners, thank you so much. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge our amazing ISPS team. Um, yes. I have three of them here. They do outstanding work within the community. Thank you particularly to Sam Jenkins, Matthew Lee, and our new member, Aaron Bryce. Have a great night.